Loyal servants of Jehovah have been praying for God's kingdom to come for centuries. What assurance do we have that the Christ now reigns and will soon complete his conquest? Listen as Brother David Grajeda, a regular pioneer of 31 years and who serves as rooming overseer at this convention, presents the part, How We Know That God's Kingdom Will Come Soon. A pregnant woman in her ninth month needs no reminder she's nearing her delivery. But how does she know? She knows. She may not know the exact hour, but it's abundantly apparent to her that the baby is coming soon. In a different area, what about us? How do we know that God's kingdom will come soon? Actually, there's three lines of reasoning that we're going to use to answer that question. The first line of reasoning is scriptural. So if you'll take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter, we're going to spend a little time there to show just how we can see that proof that God's kingdom will come soon. Here in Revelation, the sixth chapter, we're going to start off with verse number one and two, and we're going to see how the prophetic word concerning the last days is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. Revelation chapter six, one. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with the voice as of thunder, Come. And I saw and look a white horse, and the one seated upon it had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went forth conquering and to complete his conquests. Ah, Bible students know that this is referring to Jesus Christ, that in the spirit of the Psalm 45 verse 4, since his enthronement in 1914, Jesus has been writing in the cause of truth and humility and righteousness. You notice that he has an offensive weapon there in verse 2, a bow. That suggests that he is yet to complete his conquest over all opposers of his kingdom. But that's not the only rider and horse mentioned here. Take a look at verse number 3. Here in verse number 3 it says, And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And another one came forth, and a fiery colored horse, and to the one seated upon it, there was granted to take away peace away from the earth, so that they would slaughter one another, and a great sword was given him. Interesting. We see that this horse shows that despite all the international cooperation and diplomacy, peace has been taken away from the earth. And certainly a proof example was World War I. All it took was two bullets from one assassin's gun to precipitate that horrible conflict in which 13 million soldiers and citizens died. Yes, they used machine guns, uh, poison gas, airplanes, submarines, some of these things for the very first time, and others phenomenally in greater proportion than in the past. Verse number five talks about a third rider and a horseman. It says, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the, the third living creature say, Come, and I saw and look a black horse, and the one seated upon it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice as if in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarius? And three quarts of barley for a denarius? And do not harm the olive oil and the wine. Well, Bible students understand this to mean that it would take almost a day's wage to be able to get something just as basic and a staple as bread. And we've seen this. There's food shortages that continue to threaten world security despite economic and scientific knowledge and advances. In fact, the one report from the United Nations pointed out that of the seven billion people on this planet, one billion of them are hungry. Verse number seven. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I saw and look, a pale horse, and the one seated upon it had the name Death. And Hades was closely following behind him. 
An authority was given them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a long sword and with food shortage and with deadly plague and with the wild beast of the field or the earth. This rider and horse symbolically, symbolically portends that all manner of pestilence, of natural disasters and other causes of death continue to reap millions of victims each year. So what are we to conclude from this here? These four riders, symbolically speaking, have made their appearance, not only prophetically, but in real life. A second line of evidence deals with the deteriorating social conditions today. Really, wickedness is advancing from bad to worse. If we take a look at 2 Timothy, the third chapter, we're familiar with that scripture. We know that for a century, the foretold conditions that are mentioned here really talk about the last days. And they've intensified. In what way? Three ways. In scope, in frequency, and duration. If you have 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, let's read it together. But know this, that in the last days, critical times hard to deal with will be here. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, self-assuming, haughty, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, disloyal, having no natural affection, not open to any agreement, slanderers without self-control, fierce without love of goodness, betrayers, headstrong, puffed up with pride, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godly devotion but proving false to its power, and from these turn away. Jehovah's servants have correctly seen that this prophecy was dealing with the last days and that it had begun to have fulfillment starting in the opening decades of the 1900s. Yet this prophecy's fulfillment has intensified, intensified, and you can see that for yourself if you read verse 13. It speaks about how wicked men and impostors will advance from bad to worse, and that's exactly what we're seeing today. Now let's do a little bit of comparison of some of the decades. Way back in the 40s, how bad were things then? Well, every so often you'd hear about some gang that would rob a bank. That made the headlines. But what about us? In the era that we live in, just a couple years ago, we experienced what seemed to be an almost economic meltdown of the banking system by greedy Wall Streeters. That's intense. Or think about delinquency. We know back, in, for example, in the 50s, uh, there were problems, and uh, that was taking place in the schools. But compare it to what's happening right now in the time we're living. Did you know that 135,000 guns, handguns, are brought to school every day in the United States? And we were talking about having no natural affection there in 2 Timothy. One boy, he beat, stabbed, and killed another younger teenager. And when he was confronted by the police officer, this is what he said. He said, I didn't really plan to kill him, but when I saw the blood, I just let go. That's intense. So, the same thing with television. Yes, you, some of you remember back in the 50s, you had some of these talk show hosts. They were sometimes a little on the edgy side. They might make a, sort of a flirtatious comment to a female contestant. But that's tame by the standards that we see. What is it that TV producers and film producers are amping up? Violence is going up. Sadistic uh, scenes are increasing. Uh, there's sexual scenes and, and contact as well as very graphic imagery. Yes, we see that things have really gotten worse. Criminals are worse than ever before. Now we're going to interview uh, some in our congregation who have had some experience uh, over the years. Uh, we have one uh, sister, Victor, and also Brother Smothers. Together, their combined years of being affiliated with Jehovah's Organization are 94 years. So, Sister Victor, let's, uh, you raised a family. Give us an idea. What was it like uh, back in the, in the 60s? I remember the schools offered a quality education for all 
ethnic groups. This was a result of the civil right legislation. And the schools, the teachers had a creative lesson plan, and the students were eager to participate. Seemed like a, a tame era. How about you, Brother Smothers? What was it like in the 60s, as you uh, recall? The entertainment was very good. We think of the programs such as Hee Haw. Now, Hee Haw was a country western comedy, and there were the Smothers Brothers, and they had a real good comedy. And never were there any nude bedroom scenes. And we think about crime, well, occasionally there was child molestation, but not as prevalent as today. But when it did happen, it really made the headlines. I see. Well, let's come back to you, Sister Victor. Let's fast forward up to the 80s. What was that like? It appears the fashion fads of the 80s have led to today's scanty and baggy attire. As for the schools, it appears the public and political elements have no immediate fix for the broken education system. Thank you, Sister Victor. Let's get your comment on the 80s, uh, Brother Smothers. It has been a dramatic increase in crime and violence. Today, most altercations are resolved with a weapon. I remember reading, in the United States alone, one violent crime every 24 seconds. That's unheard of. Years in the past, crime and violence of this magnitude never happened. So we see today then the violent criminals, the financial criminals, they continue to flourish at a rate and scope as never before. Thank you, Brother Smithers and Sister Victor, for your comments and your observations. If you still have 2 Timothy open there, notice something very interesting about the way that verse is framed. Right there in verse 1, it says, But know this. Know this. This is Jehovah's way of assuring us, guaranteeing that conditions would worsen as we would get closer to the time when God's king, kingdom would come. Know this. In fact, you, perhaps you remember as a, a young person going to school, maybe your, your dad or mom said, Hey, look, I'm expecting, know this, I'm expecting you home at a certain time. And when they use that frame, you know, that was a guarantee that it wouldn't go well for us if we didn't follow that. So this is a guarantee that Jehovah here is providing for us. Now, let's clarify one thing. Yes, times are very difficult and hard to deal with, as uh, our interviewees pointed out. But it's not impossible, and we can deal with these only, of course, with Jehovah's help. Okay, now the third line of evidence. The third line of evidence deals with developments among God's people, particularly those of the anointed. And to go back and uh, deal on that subject, let's go back to Revelation chapter 6 and pick up here in verse number 9 through 11. That's Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the witness work that they used to have. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Until when, sovereign Lord, holy and true, are you refraining from judging and avenging our blood upon those who dwell upon the earth? And a white robe was given to each one of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number was filled of their fellow slaves and their brothers who were about to be killed as they also had been. So this helps us to appreciate something about the heavenly resurrection of the faithful anointed ones. We know that began uh, shortly after Jesus Christ was enthroned in the heavens. But those of the anointed that are still on the earth, they still have to prove their integrity under trial and persecution. But a key point for us is that the vast majority of the anointed are no longer with us, showing that we really are at a point where there's very few, relatively speaking. 
Now, there in Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 34, Jesus said that this generation, referring to the anointed, would by no means pass away until all these things would occur. What is this generation, for clarification? This generation basically consists not of one, but of two groups of the anointed. Group number one uh, that makes up this group were not merely born in 1914, or they weren't merely alive to witness the onset of Christ's presence, but they were spirit anointed in or before 1914. So that group really, we might say, is almost out of the picture. It's, uh, there are very few of them left. The second group is also of the anointed, and they sort of overlap, if you will, the lifetime of the first group. Those in the second group themselves, they're getting up in years. But they will by no means pass away before all of Jesus' prophetic words concerning his presence are fulfilled. What does this mean? What it means is, is that we are in an era where there is very little time left. That's how we know God's kingdom will come soon. Christ is soon to complete his conquest. We talked about that uh, bow he had, symbolically speaking, which basically re indicates that those who refuse to accept the authority of the victorious rider of the white horse, Jesus Christ, will soon be forced to admit to their demise their error. Let's go back to that scripture in Revelation chapter 6. And we're interested in verse number 12 now. That's Revelation chapter 6 and verses 12 through 17. And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and a great earthquake occurred, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the entire moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell from, to the earth as when a fig tree shaken by a high wind casts its unripe figs. And the heaven departed as a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and every island were removed from their places, and the kings of the earth, and the top-ranking ones, and the military commanders, and the rich and the strong ones, and every slave and every free person hid themselves in the caves and in the rock masses of the mountains. And they, kept, they keep saying to the mountains and to the rock masses, Fall over us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, Because the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Well, who is able to stand? That's what they'll be asking. But we know. We've read the next chapter. Chapter 7 of Revelation describes that the few remaining ones of the anointed and the great crowd of other sheep will be there left to survive that wicked war and that Jehovah will protect. Christ will soon complete his conquest by waging the final war in righteousness and then he will guide those who are grateful Armageddon survivors into paradise. But wait a minute. Does that mean that there's nothing good that we can say about this old wicked system of things? Yes, there is something good we can say about this old wicked system of things. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. So, may we, sensing the urgency of our time, pray to Jehovah, let your kingdom come. Thank you, Brother Grajeda, for that timely spiritual encouragement.